The following podcast was recorded on Monday, October 24th, 2022, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Kristen. Today, Sam will be discussing all things currency. Sam, when it comes to the coverage of the financial market, two things are covered incessantly, FOMC's tightening policy and interest rates. And then there's the strength of the US dollar. What are your thoughts? So there's a, there's a lot going on here, right? There's there's the old adage of when you raise interest rates, you're going to strengthen your currency, right? There, that's kind of an idea uh, that markets have had for a very very long time, right? You raise interest rates, you increase the interest rate differential, you make your currency more attractive, investment flows, blah blah blah, you get a stronger dollar. But what's interesting to me about this time around is that the Fed has gone much faster, much further than pretty much any central bank in the developed world. And it doesn't really show any signs of slowing down. If you look at kind of how far we've come so far, we haven't even really caught up to the 10 year, right? Usually when you begin to have the end of a tightening cycle, the Fed funds rate actually goes through the US 10 year. And, you know, maybe that will happen with the next uh, 75 basis point hike we see from the Fed that's pretty much locked in. Or maybe it'll happen after the 50 basis point hike in December that's also pretty much locked in. You know, that's 125 basis points of tightening that's still on the table for this year. Uh, So you could kind of begin to see that happening. And once you begin to see the 10 year roll through the Fed funds rate, that's when you really begin to have potentially a topping of the dollar. Um, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the way that I I like to think about it, and that's simply not here yet. I think that's something to really keep in mind as we begin to think about just how strong the dollar can be and just how persistent the dollar strength can can be and can get. You have a chart on the performance of emerging and developed market currencies. Who's leading the battle the battle of the currencies? Who's our best performer? This is this is the irony, I, I think, uh, and kind of great about this current situation, is that emerging market currencies have outperformed developed market currencies with a, on a pretty consistent basis. And there's a there's a couple of reasons that I think are important here. One is emerging markets have much more experience with significant inflationary events. Right, those central banks have dealt with inflation in a way that developed market central banks really haven't for a very long time. So when they begin to see inflation uh, build up and they think inflation is a problem, they raise rates and they raise rates very quickly, very fast, and tend to over tighten potentially, uh, both to defend their currency, but also to get inflation under control, right? In a lot of emerging markets, having a high inflation rate is akin to potentially having riots in the streets, you know, shortages of food, fuel, et cetera. Uh, Whereas in developed markets, that really hasn't been the case. So you have a much slower reaction function within the developed markets, whether it's the Euro, whether it's, uh, you know, Japan, these are things that you know, you simply haven't had for a very long time. And so you don't react fast enough and you begin to have those inflation pressures build, but your interest rates are still extremely low and you're still a little too loose. And so those inflation pressures continue to build. That's that's the developed market problem here. And the currencies are kind of showing you that, that there's a much more significant demand for the US dollar and emerging market currencies in many cases than there are for some of the quote unquote longer term stable developed markets. And that's that's a that's kind of a sea change to what we've seen over the past 20, maybe even 30 years. There have been few places to hide during the dollar's rapid ascent. What's the performance of currencies of oil importing and exporting nations? 
Yeah, and this is something we said uh, kind of earlier in the year, I would say tangentially, uh, when we said, you know, one of the places to hide in an inflationary environment is actually in oil and gas, right? It's very difficult uh, to find a better inflation hedge than it is to than energy. Uh, generally. Uh, and this is one of the kind of curious things is that if you look at a significant oil and energy importer uh, like Japan, uh, their currency has underperformed. It's underperformed for a number of reasons. One is the Bank of Japan's still, you know, locking interest rates in on the 10 year. Uh, but there's also this underlying problem of you have to import a lot of energy and energy prices are rising energy energy is a you know scarce resource in this environment and so you begin to have those currency cells to sell off uh, if you kind of ignore the ruble because that's untradeable in a lot of ways for most of the western world you know if you look at the nara and the, the nigerian nara if you look at the canadian dollar those are the two next best performing uh, currencies on this chart and the reason and one of the main reasons for that is they have energy and oil exports they are relatively insulated from the extreme moves whereas a euro area a japan and india they import an incredible amount of their energy and they're going to continue to do so and at these prices it's it's going to have an it's going to have an impact both on their currency and their economic outlook what role of trade dynamics played uh, it, it, a lot of that is, you know, kind of over time, right? Japan and the Euro area uh, were both extreme exporters in, in, in a way that kind of, you know, Germany, for instance, was uh, called the high-end manufacturing hub of the world. You know, Japan, a very similar thing. Uh, that was Those were tailwinds for their currency. Those strengthened the currency significantly. Uh, when you have energy problems, you tend to have manufacturing problems, and that's really affecting their current account at the moment. And you know you're seeing germany and japan both go dangerously close to negative or negative that trade balance is going to filter through to the currencies that's part of what we're seeing right now and a lot of it is thanks to energy so it kind of all comes back in a giant circle to uh, an energy shortage globally sam in summary today what should we be watching for next uh, what we should be watching for next uh, more intervention, uh, whether it's job boning by the Bank of Japan, whether it's straight FX intervention by the Bank of Japan, uh, how they go about it when they're still doing yield curve control on their tenure. I think that's going to be an extremely intriguing case uh, because it's more than likely that they're going to have to lift that trading ban on the tenure JGB in order to really kind of Get their currency under control so i think that'll be one thing to watch for another thing to watch for will be the reaction from the ecb uh here given the inflation dynamics on the continent and how they need to react to that uh, if you begin to see any sort of significant hawkishness out of the ecb i think that'll be a tailwind to the euro uh, but i wouldn't hold my breath that simply is not the way that they have conducted monetary policy uh, in the past and it really hasn't been their uh, the tenor of their language uh, in recent weeks. Sam, thank you for your thoughts today and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianco Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks everyone and have a great week.